G'day, I'm Paul. So, Kia, they have been busy. They have facelifted the Sorento, but it's not actually just changes to the skin. This goes a little bit further than that with new suspension. So I'm gonna run you through all of those changes and how it drives. This is actually one of the best selling SUVs in Australia, or larger SUVs if you exclude all the ute based SUVs. So it does really well, even though Kia has been massively supply constrained as well. Now this is the top specification GT line diesel variant. It's priced at just under $70,000, but if that is too expensive, the whole range kicks off at a little over 50 grand. And this competes with things like the Santa Fe, the Kluger, it's that sort of size of vehicle. Today we're going to do a detailed review of this car, so if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes that are on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we drive a facelifted Kia. Now let's look about the exterior. Optional colors, 695 bucks, so not overly expensive. I do like this new color. It really just suits this top spec model very nicely. In terms of the design change, you see down the front here, this headlight looks a little bit different. It kind of has EV9 vibes to it. And when you see this vehicle in person, it actually looks really cool. You've got this LED daytime running light, and then you've got this bank of uh, LEDs that cascade down from there and then a big grill here with that sort of 3D texture of it. I know that I've mentioned this before, but I really do like this Kia logo, the way that it sort of sits, sort of shaved off the bonnet there. It's like they've taken it out a big bit of uh, metal or something like that and just stuck it on there. So that looks really cool. And then down the bottom here, you've got some glossy highlights as well to sort of bring out that um, whole front end. Now around the side here, we have a set of 20 inch alloy wheels. We've got a machined finish up the top there and then piano black through the center. Now it is worth mentioning one of the big changes they've made here is is with the suspension. So it uses a similar setup to the EV6. So I'm really interested to see how that affects this because Kia, unlike a lot of other brands in Australia, does a lot of ride and handling tuning specific for the Australian market. So we'll see how that goes. In terms of ground clearance, yes, this is all wheel drive, but you're not really gonna be going off-roading in it with a ground clearance of just under 180 mil. A bit of wheel arch cladding there. This little highlight there as well. Piano black there under that wing mirror. You've got privacy glass. You've got a glass roof there as well. Roof rails, and then come around to the back with me. Now, sorry about the flies, it is out of control at the moment. Uh, LED tail lights here, I love this as well. So it's like a sort of divided bank there with this center section blocking it out, but that looks really nice and interesting. Uh, 4X here for the all wheel drive spec, and then Sorento there as well. Shark fin aerial up the top, you'll notice a camera here. This is actually for the digital rear view mirror. So you have a separate camera here for the reverse camera. So just something interesting there. Now let me know what you reckon about the design of the Kia Sorento or the facelift of it. Let me know in the comments section below. Have you got one on order? Have you got one of the previous ones on order and have been waiting 12 months like a lot of people? Let me know in the comments section below. Now we are inside the Sorento. We'll start off with the key. Look at this, very fancy. So it's got a rubber finish, Kia up the top there. When you push the button, that lights up as well, which is cool. It's recycled on the EV9, very fancy. Unlock, push to open the boot. Another Kia logo up the top there. Then you've got remote start and then the self-parking feature. Well, not really self-parking, it just moves the car forwards and backwards to get you out of park. This is a proximity sensing key, so you can grab the door handle. You've got a push button start just down here. Now, not a huge amount has changed here, but just some of the key elements. This has come from EV9, so it's a new evolution of Kia's infotainment system. I'll run you through some of those details in just a sec. Notice this is different as well, so this now mimics the Sportage. So you've got those multiple uh, menu items there to work with. Um, and then a lot of piano black down here, grumble, grumble, but um, I guess it is what it is. We just have to deal with that. Now, in terms of your touch points, look at that, that's nice and soft. Soft on the door as well, it all feels really good. How soft is it? We've got our durometer, we've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you do wanna see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, build quality. What's that like? That's all pretty solid in the center there, all looks good. And then it's our door slam. Moving on to infotainment. So two sets of 12.3 inch displays. This one here is a touch screen. So you can basically move between the menus there. I quite like this setup. They've sort of simplified it, but it still looks really nice and classy. You can swipe down from the top for additional quick controls. I love uh, quiet mode, but I also love passenger talk. Just the ability to press the button and then your talking goes to the back of the cabin. So I can hear it echoing there. It just means you can tell the kids to be quiet from the front of the car uh, in a much easier 
much easier way. Um, in addition to that, you have inbuilt smartphone mirroring in the form of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Apple CarPlay, finally wireless. They've solved the issue that they've had for ages now about wireless smartphone mirroring not working, and that is really nice and quick and sharp. Very good. And this is what Android Auto looks like, so wireless as well. Uh, full screen integration, that'll looks very nice, very nice indeed. Okay, so rest of the infotainment system, what do we got here? So uh, car wash mode, voice memos, in case you get any brain waves out on the road. Uh, in addition to that, you've also got a 12 speaker Bose branded sound system. It's a pretty decent sound system there if you're into your music. You also have inbuilt satellite navigation as well. Head of the driver here, that 12.3 inch display gives you critical information. Can't really do a great deal with it, can't change the sort of layout as far as I can tell, so that'd be nice to do, but um, not exactly the end of the world. Now, safety, you've got autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You've got a lane departure warning with a lane keeping assistant. Uh, it also has a highway driving assistant as well that I'll run you through a little bit later on. You have a blind spot monitor built into uh, the screen here and also the wing mirrors as well, which is a really cool system. You've got rear cross traffic alert, a junction assistant, front and rear parking sensors with a 360 camera that I'll show you in a sec, but you also now have connected services. So it means that not only is your infotainment system connected but you can connect to the car through your phone and then you've got an SOS button there as well. So this is what the camera looks like. Here it is there. So not a bad setup. That's our rear view. Look at that. Very nice and sharp. Oh, very fancy. That's our 360 degree view. Not bad at all. And this is what the horn sounds like. Moving on to practicality and we'll start off with your connectivity. Where are you going to charge your phone? So in here, you've got two USB-C outlets. I do love this feature. You can flick between just charging and also throughput uh, on the USB device. So really clever setup. You yeah, have wireless phone charging as well in terms of storing your phone. That can kind of just live wherever you want. Coffee cups. How does it go with a man-ish man sized coffee cup? Uh, fits right in there without getting delittered, which is good. Water bottle. No dramas there with teeth as well. Try a big bottle inside the door. That doesn't fit. That's annoying. Yeah. Anyway, um, other storage, you've got a center console here with a coin tray. Nice and deep in there as well. Glove box over here, reasonably sized. In terms of your comfort features, you have dual zone automatic climate control up the front here. You have heated and cooled seats. You have a heated steering wheel. Really is just a bit of everything here. Uh, in terms of comfort, so seats are actually really nice. You have quilted Nappa leather. How fancy is that? You've got 14 way power adjustment for the driver's seat. So you can go forwards, backwards. Backrest can go forwards and backwards. You can lift the front of the seat back of the seat. You've got lumbar adjustment there as well. It's quite a nice setup. You've also got the ability to extend this bottom section too. Seat memory for the driver and steering offers both tilt and reach adjustments. And on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Now, second row of the Sorento, what's it like? So knee room is pretty good. Toe room is pretty decent as well. Headroom is okay. I think if you're a little taller, your head might just be touching that. In terms of your creature comforts, you've got air vents back here. You've got a 12 volt outlet down there, two USB-C ports, have the ability to move the passenger seat out of the way, which is cool. Um, heated seats on the outboard seats. You've got cup holders inside the doors, center armrest here with three cup holders. You also have the ability to move the second row forwards and backwards to give your third row more room or alternatively give yourself more boot room as well. You've got ISO fixed points on your outboard seats and three top tether points, privacy lines. And then what about our window test? Let's see if it goes all the way down. Oh, look at that, winner winner. And it's auto up and down as well. Okay, now this is the part of the video where you get to see the grown man that loves KFC try and get into the third row, which is predominantly designed for kids, but I want to give you an idea of how much space there is. Uh, you press that button up the top, it tumbles forward. Well, actually, the top of it tumbles forward and then it slides. Now, you have to kind of be a contortionist to work your way into here, but I'll give it a shot anyway. So, that's actually not terrible if I lift that up as well. Yeah, so headroom is sort of pretty compromised there, but ultimately the second row can slide forward if you do want to give uh, your third row occupants a bit of room. To be honest, if I was an adult sitting here, it wouldn't be the end of the world. I've actually been in 
more cramped spaces in bigger vehicles. So uh, it's perfectly fine. You've got air vents over here. You've got your own blower controls, a 12 volt outlet, USB-C outlets as well, along with cup holders and knick-knacky holders. It is worth noting though, that the airbag coverage doesn't extend to the third row. So it sort of stops around here somewhere. So not really providing airbag coverage to uh, your third row occupants. Now, in addition to all of that, you've got ISOFIX points on these two seats as well. So you can have a whole stack of kids in this car. So cargo space, uh, yeah, being a three row SUV, tends to be a little bit compromised if you do have your third row in place. So here you have a little under 200 litres of cargo space, but you do have a little bit of storage under here for your cargo blind when it's not in use, along with your jack and recovery tools. The spare tyre lives under the rear of the vehicle there. You've got some hooks off to the side as well. Now, when you drop your third row out of the way, you have just over 600 litres of cargo available. And I'll show you what it looks like with our bags in there. So there's that one. Pop this bag in as well. There you go. So you actually have a pretty decent sort of space there. And then, just so you don't have to waste too much energy, you've got buttons here to drop the second row out of the way too. So you just hit both of those and that expands the space to a tiny bit under 2,000 litres. Okay, so we have just hit the road in the Sorento. Now, there are two different engines you can pick from here. You can either go for a naturally aspirated petrol V6, uh, but that is limited just to front wheel drive, or you can go this one, which is the four cylinder diesel, and this one comes standard with all wheel drive. Before I run you through the engine specs, this does the standard stuff we've seen now in Hyundai and Kia's, which is incredibly frustrating. Every single time you start the car, you need to come in, turn off the speed limit warning because it never actually picks up the correct speed signs. Um, and then you also need to play with the driver attention alert stuff as well, because again, that also doesn't really work some of the time. I just don't know, like I get why all this stuff has to be there for safety standards and whatever, but what is the point in having it if it doesn't work well? And it's not just Kia, it just does not work well anywhere that I've seen this technology. So anyway, it's my two cents. Now this engine is a 2.2 litre turbocharged four-cylinder diesel engine. If you compare this to something like the Kluger, the Kluger's available in a hybrid, and there is a hybrid coming to the Sorento range or the facelifted Sorento range, uh, but this diesel actually gives you really good fuel economy and also gives you the punch that you need. It makes 148 kilowatts of power and 440 Newton meters of torque. So behind the wheel, you sink the foot in, and this just gives you a nice little punch in the back. It's all mated to an eight-speed dual-clutch automatic transmission. I don't love this gearbox. Uh, Hyundai has been, and Kia have been moving away from dual clutch transmissions, and that's because here at low speed, when you get to go on the throttle, it sort of sometimes can just be a little bit hesitant and elastic. It doesn't feel overly natural or progressive. So um, yeah, and then even like if we just stand on the throttle, it's still not razor sharp either. So it's not like they've got a dual clutch gearbox in there for performance, it's all just for economy. Um, now, speaking of economy, uh, Kia claims a combined average of six liters per 100 Ks. Uh, let's have a look at what we're seeing here. Eight liters per 100, that's actually pretty good. We've done a lot of our sportier driving uh, earlier in the day. So that, that figure is actually not too bad. Now this is uh, the type of all wheel drive system that is going to be sending torque around the car as required. So I'm gonna just switch over to this view here. So you can see now with light throttle, we're predominantly going uh, to the front wheels there, but then as I progressively apply more throttle, most of it's going to the front wheels, but then we have a little bit going to the rear wheels as well. And it just means that if you are in certain conditions where you do get slip of those wheels, it's able to pulse torque to the rear and just get you out of that situation pretty easily. Also really handy when it comes to towing as well. So the 2000 kilo brake towing capacity. Now, one of the big changes here has been the suspension. So this uses what they call a frequency selective damper. And what that means effectively, and they use this in the EV6 and the EV9 as well, Instead of it being an adaptive damping system that requires a lot of tuning work and a lot of effort to make right, this actually requires less tuning but can be variable depending on the frequency of the surface that you're on. So when you are driving over something that is quite bumpy and a uh, higher frequency, it's able to basically soften out the damper so you're getting a nice and smooth ride. But when you're turning into a corner and you're getting a low frequency event where the car's sort of leaning onto the side gradually, it's able to stiffen up the damper 
that basically gives you better body control, which we'll test out shortly. Uh, but so far, in and around the city, this, this ride is significantly better than it was previously, and it was actually pretty good to start with. So let's see what it's like here on our sine waves. We do this at 130, which is the maximum speed limit in Australia. We'll just see whether it still retains its ride and body control over this. Yeah, that's fine. For a big SUV, it sort of stays up a little higher, uh, but it's actually not too bad. It's sort of got decent composure and body control there. So you can see that they have actually put a bit of effort into making this nice and comfortable in and around the city, and then not too bad over there as well. Now, bumpy road time. Now, this is where I think we're gonna see the benefits of this uh, frequency selective damper. Do this at 90 k's an hour, and there is here what we call a high frequency sine wave. So this is where the system's gonna be working quite hard to take advantage of a, a parallel reservoir they have within that chamber. Here it is. Excellent. So yeah, basically you have a parallel reservoir that, that it can use to then uh, change the, the sort of damper feel as it's going. And then when it detects that higher frequency, it will then soften it up so you're not getting that smashing effect through the cabin that you would get if you went with a tighter suspension tune for handling. So it really is the best of both worlds. Now, what about noise inside the cabin here? I think this is something they appear to have worked on as well because it is really quiet in here. Uh, we tested it with our calibrated sound meter and this is how it went. If you want to see how this car compares to other vehicles that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. So what about your visibility? Look, you can see clearly down the front there, wing mirrors are nice and big. You've got the blind spot camera built into here, which is fantastic. Um, you also have this, which I don't know, a lot of people like or don't like, but it's a great idea if you do have the third row in use, because if you don't have that uh, sort of active, you do get visibility out of the rear window, that's fine. But when the third row is in place, it is tricky to see with kids' heads and stuff. So just give that a flick and then on it goes and it makes life much easier. Now let's talk drive modes. So you've got a number of off-road modes and let me know if you do want us to do some light off-roading in cars like this in the future. I won't do any today, but if you do want it, I'll see if I can organize it. You've got normal eco, sport and smart. Pop it into sport, we'll go for a lap of our track here. Obviously this isn't a sports car, but we test all the cars in the same way, back to back, I guess, just to see exactly how they feel once the speed does pick up. And then just to see what it feels like here with these suspension changes too. There you go, so immediately there, I can feel the body is sitting flatter, even on a higher speed uh, corner like this. The body sits nice and flat, doesn't have that huge amount of body roll, which I remembered the pre-facelift having, and that is thanks to that suspension, even with direction changes like we have at the back here, and they're under braking as well, it feels nice and confident. Good steering feel as well, um, and then if you do compare this to stuff like Santa Fe, which doesn't have the benefit of having a, a sort of local ride and handling tune. This feels much more composed. I'll be interested to see what the new Santa Fe is like, given it's a, it's a brand new model. This actually feels really surprisingly good. Only in our back straight, just lean onto this. Yeah, very nice. Very, very nice. Very impressed with that. This is a big vehicle and it is just sticking to the road beautifully. So yeah, good job Kia. Righto, so let's just test some of the autonomous driving systems here. See how well all of this works. Do this at um, 70 k's an hour. And the whole idea is we want to see how well it's going to keep you in your lane. And we use the bowl for that because it's kind of a, a good indication of what it's actually like on a normal road as well. So switch all this on. So you can see the steering wheel is green, the lane departure signals are green. So we're going to test the three outer lanes. This also has highway driving assistant that we tested in the EV9 and it's actually quite good. It only works on, I guess, highways that are noted within uh, the GPS system. So here we can't use it, but it's designed to just give the vehicle a bit more confidence on a freeway and, and take a bit more control over when it comes to things. Gives you some really good sort of notes up on the head-up display as well. So quite a good system. So lane one here, it's fine. Uh, we'll jump over to our second lane that to lock on. Okay, it's holding nicely there in the second lane. Awesome, I'll jump over to our most banked lane. This is just designed to, to give you an indication of how much torque it's willing to apply to the steering when you are on just a normal road. Let's see how it goes here. Yeah, it doesn't want to 
detect our lines. Yeah, that's the issue. Sometimes it doesn't love the way that we test this, but uh, it works okay out on the main road. But yeah, it's just not loving our third lane here. Okay, time for some performance testing. Before we do that, I wanted to tell you about our website, carexpert.com.au, uh, and also Help Me Car Expert. If you Google Help Me Car Expert, it'll take you to our site, give you a really good summary of what we do and how we can help you when you're buying a new car, including connecting you with our network of vetted dealers who will get you a deal on a car that's in stock. Maybe not a Sorento right now, because there's a long wait, but uh, get in touch anyway. Got comparison tools and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so we're going to pop this into sport mode. Well, there is no sort of official 0 to 100 time, but we'll see how we go. I've got traction control off there. So I'll load her up and um, see what happens. Here we go. Okay, it's 90, 100. We're going to go all the way through to 120 here so we can see our 80 to 120 time as well. Okie dokie. All right, come to a stop. Given how far I've gone down our exit road, I don't think it's overly quick, so let's have a little look. Okie dokie, so 0 to 100, 9.05 seconds, and then 80 to 120 in 6.91 seconds. So not stupidly quick. Um, yeah, that's where the V6 is going to benefit ever so slightly. Now I'm curious as well to see, when we reverse up our hill here, what it's like with the dual clutch. It's not too bad, actually. There you go. All right. Interesting. Okay, time for our stop from 100. I'm going to test to see how quickly this pulls up. Someone made a really good point the other day that we're not actually testing the brakes here. Because if it is getting to an ABS event, which it is, the brakes are doing their job. We're actually testing the tyres. And I guess how the whole vehicle behaves when it's under brakes as well. So our brake test would require repeated stops from 100 k's an hour to see how long they last. But um, each vehicle's brakes will last for, for the short duration that we're stopping. But it is a combination of the brakes and tyres that will give us an idea of how quickly it stops. So thank you for that comment. Um, so 100 to zero. Wow, that is really impressive. 2.61 seconds and 35.99 metres. That is remarkably good. Uh, that is sort of sedan good. So it does show you that uh, coupled with decent tyres and, and decent brakes here that you can get a big SUV like this to pull up nicely. Uh, a lot of the ute-based SUVs on all-terrain tyres are stopping in over 40 metres. So this is giving you an extra five metres of space there to work with. So pretty impressed with that. And now our reverse acceleration test. I'll turn off traction control, see if we can get some more speed out of it. Here we go. 40 kilometres an hour. So there you are, the new Kia Sorento. Well, the facelifted new Kia Sorento. There are a stack of changes, normally with facelifts. I don't really recommend people go and trade in their existing car to a facelift just because it looks different, but you can if you want. Here, there's actually enough substance under the skin there to make it worthwhile. You've got the connected services. The ride is greatly improved, even though it wasn't bad to start with. So it does actually all make quite a difference. What I'd love to see in the future with this car is a V6 diesel. That would really just make this the most epic road tourer. And perhaps uh, Kia is working on a ute. Perhaps if they put a V6 diesel in that, that could eventually make its way to here. You never know. Let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you got one of these on order? How long have you been waiting? Are you going to be switched into the new one? I'm keen to hear your thoughts let me know down there if you did enjoy this video please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates and if you haven't done so already subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon as well but until next time take it easy